Dear students, in this lecture, we shall learn about another type of functions, which is known as linear functions. Let's get started. Uh, firstly, we should do the etymology of this word, and that word is polynomial, because mostly what we see is that we are starting from polynomial functions. Poly means many and nominal means parts. So it means that anything which is polynomial is going to have many parts. In a functional form, you can see we have written that y is equal to a0 plus a1x, a2x, and then continuing this process till an, xn. So you see there are many parts, or in other words, there are n parts of this uh, polynomial function. Now, uh, Polynomial function is a general form of functions. It can give rise to many types of functions, one of which is linear functions. So by a little bit of substitution, we can get the linear function from polynomial functions. Uh, as I have told you that putting the value of a certain thing that is n, we can get various types of functions. So in this case, n is equal to 1. When we put 1 in place of n, we get a linear function and the whole polynomial function gets reduced to this expression only because the maximum value of n is now 1 and all of this part will not be included. Whereas the x has this power 1 which we do not write conventionally. However, we know it is there in the supercrypt or in the power of the variable x. Now, we can say that the highest power of any function's variable, that is the independent variable, is also known as the degree of the equation. In this case, the highest power of the variable is 1. Therefore, we can say that the degree of this equation, that is a linear equation, is 1. Now, we are coming to some diagrams. And in this case, before we understand these diagrams, we need to know about intercept and an intercept is basically a point where one of the coordinates is zero. If x is equal to zero, then it will give rise to y-intercept or vertical intercept. As you can see, if we put x is equal to zero in the linear function that we just extracted in the last slide, we will be left only with a naught. So y will be equal to a naught only. As we can see that the term a1x has disappeared because of the substitution of this value. Now we have the y-intercept here, that is a0. Let us look at this diagram. Basically, it is a linear function, but it is giving us the liberty of looking at a positively sloped linear function as well as a negatively sloped linear function. This one is a positively sloped linear function, as you can see. And this one, the other one, the one which is below, is having a negative slope. However, both of them have y-intercepts as well as x-intercepts. Because x-intercept is also a reality, we can put y is equal to 0 in order to get the x-intercept. However, we extracted the value of y-intercept only in our discussion that we just did. So the concept of intercept holds both on positively sloped and negatively sloped linear functions. This a1 basically shows us that it is having a positive slope and if this a1 is negative, it means that it is a negative slope, which was expressed in the last equation that we just saw. It is actually the representation of the slope in a linear function. Now we get to this economic example, which is very famous. We have been talking about the consumption function in our economic theory, and it has two parts. One is the autonomous part, and that is the induced part. And once we plot it, we get positively sloped curve, and we can see that income is the independent variable, and the dependent variable is consumption expenditure. The intercept is represented with C0, and it is also known as autonomous consumption, whereas the slope is represented by the small c. And this small c is also known as marginal propensity to consume, alternatively, MPC. So, in this way, we can see a linear function is used to represent and to understand a consumption function in economic theory. Another example is in front of us. The famous market equilibrium is there, and we can see that there is 
a supply function and there is a demand function. And both of them are linear functions because we can see they are straight lines. And that is the consequence of the two curves intersecting each other and giving rise to this equilibrium. However, this shows that linear functions are extensively used in economic theory. Now, this is a caveat, a very important thing that we must remember because the word is not as simple as we see in economics. In economics, we usually use the linear functions, but this is a compromise because in real life, the relationships are never necessarily linear. Rather, they can be nonlinear in many cases. Let's consider this demand function, which is dairy demand function, and uh, the dependent variable and the independent variables, they are on x and y axis respectively. And these are the points that we have obtained after data collection, as you can see. So using these points, if I combine these points, I'm not going to get a straight line. Rather, I'm going to get a line which is something like this. So it's not a straight line. However, we don't do that. Rather, we choose the straight line, which is a sort of uh, average line that is passing through this uh, set of points. This is a compromise. And we say that we are assuming that the relationship is linear. So this is what we need to understand. In real life, the relationships are not necessarily linear. And we do a lot of compromise when we say that they are linear. However, it facilitates the calculations and estimations and make things easier for us to understand.